Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, guys. Stacy with me. Shalom. And in today's class, we're going to be talking about the first fruits offering and what it's really all about. Okay. We're here on May the 13th in the year 2023. And for many people watching this channel, they're getting ready for first fruits. In the second month, having kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover for the second month. Right. You see here, the 50 days of their first fruits offering starts sometime around May the 14th. Mm -hmm. So in this video, we want to look at the scripture that talks about what we're supposed to do on this day. But I also want to give a little bit of my testimony and what I've learned in relationship to what this offering is all about. Turns out it's one of the most important things of the feast day. All right. So we're looking here at Leviticus chapter 23, verse 10 starts talking about the feast of the first fruits. And we've covered this in a lot of videos, but we'll let you go ahead and read a few of these verses. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye be come into the land which I give unto you and shall reap the harvest thereof, then you shall bring a sheep of the first fruits of your harvest unto the priest. So this is talking about the first fruit celebration. Like I said, it happens after the Feast of Unleavened Bread is over with. This would have been the same for those who kept first Passover. Look at on this calendar, you could tell that they're somewhere around day 31 of that Omar count. But let's go on. And he shall wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted for you. On the morrow after the Sabbath, the priest shall wave it. So this is the wave offering of the first fruits. All right. And you shall offer that day when you wave the sheep and he lamb without blemish of the first year for a burnt offering unto the Lord. So here is telling them as a part of the wave offering, the people are supposed to give a lamb to the priest. Mm -hmm. And you have to remember back in the day, just about everybody was raising lambs. Mm -hmm. But those who were raising other animals, like a cow would have given a calf, or if their produce was of some other nature, what this is saying is that they are to give a small portion of that right after the Feast of first fruit starts. And the meat offering thereof, shall be two tenth deals of fine flour mingled with oil, an offering made by fire unto the Lord for a sweet savor, and the drink offering thereof shall be of wine, the fourth part of an hen. Now what's interesting about this, these are the elements of Passover. Right. But let's get down to verse 14 to get into the meat of what we're talking about in this video. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched corn nor green ears, unto the self same day that ye have brought an offering unto your God. It shall be a statue forever throughout your generations in all your dwellings. So here it is telling us that after the Feast of Unleavened Bread is over, we ought to do this wave offering. And it tells us up there what the wave offering consists of. But then down here in verse 14, it's telling us that we are not supposed to eat bread or any kind of parched corn, like roasted corn or anything, like roasted wheat or anything, until we've actually made this offering. Okay, like sort of like a fast. Kind of yeah. like a fast. I think what it's trying to say is that the timeliness of it is extremely important, saying that you're not supposed to eat bread until you've actually met this obligation right this video is brought to you by the celestial clock calendar the official timepiece of the 144,000 get your celestial clock calendar at coachingafight.shop or follow the links in the description below but now let's get into my personal testimony on this matter mm -hmm. because back during first Passover or first first fruits of the year 2023 I was asked a question in the comment section from a number of viewers asking where are they supposed to give this lamb and this oil and you know all of these other offerings for this wave offering they have 50 days in order to do it and they asked me what were they supposed to do with it you're saying because are they saying that they do not have a priest is mm -hmm. that what they're well saying? one of them went as far as to say that they wanted to give to a servant of the father who was actually keeping a feast day and they didn't know anybody around. Mm -hmm. So what I suggested to them, trying to avoid the real answer, 
because I don't want to tell anybody to send me anything. Mm -hmm. You know, I kind of let them know what the requirement is. But what they choose to do with their offering, I kind of leave is up to them. Right. And when I got the question, I kind of felt like I was being tricked a little bit because the right answer is that they're supposed to send it to me. Mm -hmm. But to ask a person to send me money or anything like that will make me a false prophet. Right. Okay, how so? Because a true servant of our Father never has to ask a person for anything. Mm -hmm. They rely on our Father to give them what they need. So they would never have to do something like come on a YouTube video and tell people to send them stuff. That shows their lack of faith and that they don't believe. Because what does the scripture say? Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and all these things will be added onto you. Right. They don't say get on a YouTube video and ask people to send them your tithes money. Right. So when I got the question, I'm trying to answer it without actually telling them to send me anything. Right. So I told them to use their offering as a seed mm -hmm. to take what they had to offer and take it to their local Levi, whether it was their son, their daddy, their brother, whoever it was who was supposed to be keeping the role in their family to actually take their offering and give it to them, mm -hmm. even though they are not, to actually take their offering and give it to them anyway mm -hmm. and explain to them that they are a Levi, that they are the firstborn. And according to the scripture, they have a responsibility of bringing the word in exchange for our tithes and offerings. So while the person, the potential Levi, is not reading the scripture according to them or during the feast days or anything. What I suggested was they take their tithes and give it to them, maybe hoping that it will make them understand how they fit in our father's plan and would actually do them some good. Right. Sounded like a good idea to me. Mm -hmm. And so I tried it. Okay. I thought about it for a while and I said, well, you know, I have a lamb that I have to give and I have my offering that I have to make. Nothing excludes me for it. So I simply went and found a local Levi. Right. A person who happened to be a firstborn male who lives pretty close to me and I gave them the offering. I explained to them what it means to be a Levi and then I gave them the offering that I had to offer. Right. The lamb the wine, the bread, the oil, and some other stuff. I gave them a clock, and I even gave them a copy of the Third Testament of the Bible as my offering and sent them away. Okay, so this is a testimony, so what happened? Well, of course, nothing happened with him personally. He kind of went off and said thank you, showed his necessary appreciation, and that was it. I haven't really heard from him since. Mm -hmm. But that was only the start. That was only the portion of the scripture that, that's described here in Leviticus 23. But I also had some money to give. Right. So I found another local guy from the community. Mm -hmm. He is a, also a firstborn, but he was at the age of 49 years old, which means that his term of service is almost over. Of course, he, you're not allowed to do the temple services after the age of 50. Right. So he's all, he has a little short time, but he's kind of missed his Levi training. So I gave him the monetary portion instead of the bread and the wine portion, like I gave the other guy, thinking that the other guy may actually put it to use. Okay. So now after these two acts of charity, I started noticing things changing around the house. My first thing that I noticed was my health. Mm -hmm. And whereas I'd been struggling with some virus or bacterial infection, you guys probably heard it in the video with me sniffing and, and I haven't gotten over it yet. I still have the residual cough. But after I started giving, I noticed that the ailment started going away. I noticed that it also, I was wondering, well, I was actually thinking that it sounds great. Mm -hmm. But that was only the start. After that, and I started noticing positive changes in both my surroundings and my health and, you know, everything else, I started giving more and more and more 
and started looking for opportunities to give. Even getting to the point of taking every opportunity I could get to do something for somebody. You know, if I'm sitting there talking and somebody looks at an item I have and they say, oh, I wish I had one of them. <laughs> I gave it to them. Hmm. My point being is that the charity is various. Not only am I giving away money and lambs and books and clocks, but I'm changing diapers. I'm babysitting. I'm hanging out with the elderly. I'm praying for people. Healing prayers. A wide variety of charity has taken over my life within the last month. And as a result, I'm ready to say that the ascension has started. You understand what I mean by the ascension? No, I was going to ask. What do you mean by the ascension? Let's come over here to the great book of True Life, chapter 53 and verse 25. If you would, read that. We'll read all the way through it, and then we'll come back down and break it down a little bit. Consider, my children, that you will have to climb the mountain carrying the cross of pain on your backs. But beware that the cross, which is to elevate you, will not be that of restitution of your sins, but that of your sacrifice on behalf of others. To men, I say that they should be guides, defenders, and guardians of humanity. To women, to be mothers, I say, pray for the great multitudes of children without parents, without a home, and without bread. Your prayers would be like the wings of the lark that spread to shelter her chicks. But in this instance, do not only think about your loved ones since they have your tenderness, rather think about those on no. earth who are lonely and who hunger for affection. Pray for them. Who better than you understands the coldness, the emptiness, and the thirst of those tender hearts? Pray, and soon bread, shelter, and love will come. This is the right time to be charitable. All right. Now, notice right here where he's talking about this word, elevate. That's what I mean by the ascension, this elevation. But notice right here, it says, consider my children that you will have to climb the mountain carrying the cross of pain on your backs. When it comes to the scripture and our father's plan for our salvation, when it comes to carrying or bearing the cross, this is something that every human has to take on. This is our job and what we're doing here. This is why we're going through so much troubles and pains. This is why there's just so much going on in our life is this cross that we're bearing. Everybody has this cross. It's sad that it's not really taught in our churches and stuff because just as the scripture says, you have many people who want to reach our Father, but they actually don't want to bear a cross. Right. They want their life to be smooth. full of smooth or full, you know, full of taking care of themselves. They don't really have to worry about what we're talking about here. Mm -hmm. And in other words, they're not really planning on this elevation at all. In other words, they don't want to bear their cross. But notice this part right here. It says, but be aware that the cross, which is to elevate you, will not be that of restitution. That means paying back. Paying back for the wrongs that you've done. Right. So this cross that is to elevate you is not going to be the payback for the sins that you've done. Mm -hmm. In other words, the restitution that you're paying, because we're still paying the restitution. I pay. I talked about the sicknesses earlier. We talked about pain and different stuff. People, you know, persecution, all of that's part of restitution. Right. And we all have that as part of our cross to bear. Mm -hmm. But notice what it's saying here is that this restitution is not going to elevate you. In other words, you can catch all of the beatings for the bad stuff you've done all of your life and it's still not going to elevate you. You mm -hmm. still not going to ascend to this mountain that's being talked about here. Right. It says, but that of your sacrifices on behalf of others. That's how we are to be elevated, not by our pain, but by our sacrifices. Mm -hmm. So that's what happened. That's why there was a change in my health. For example, I was paying the restitution 
because of the ill and the bad things that I've done, I was being I was being punished for it through my illnesses and my pains. Right. And when I started doing charity, those illnesses and those pains stopped and or are stopping because of the sacrifices that are being made on behalf of others. Just like it says throughout the scripture, you have two choices to gain merits necessary for reaching the kingdom of heaven. What are they? Love, um, love, which is pain. charity, and pain, and pain, which is illnesses and stuff. Right. So you have that choice in life. All of us have this choice to make. We can either keep going through the pains and the troubles and the persecutions and the hardships and the hungers and the ailments and all this other stuff, pandemics and wars and all of this other stuff that is to purify us and get us ready for the kingdom of heaven, or we can say, you know what? I'm going to bypass all of that unnecessary pain and do charitable deeds instead. Right. And when you do start doing charitable deeds, you notice things start going differently in your household because you're gaining your merits in a different way. Right. You're not having to get your merits through pain anymore. So the people around you don't have to be so hard on you. Right. Your loved ones don't have to hurt you so much. Because you can hurt yourself by doing a charity for them. So we know that, like you said, love is one way of paying your restitution. And pain is another way of paying your restitution. So what you're saying is that by choosing to do the love part, you don't necessarily have to go through the pain part. Yeah, all the stingy people got to get the mask put on. Everybody who don't like doing charitable deeds are going to have to get all of their stuff through pain, and they're all ready to getting it. You can see it in road rage and all kinds of stuff going on where people are getting these merits. What I'm saying is, is you can stop all of that bad stuff and just start being charitable. And, and, and I'm going even one step further to say if you don't, if you just going to allow the pain to be what you get, you're not going to get elevated. You're not going to you're not going to ascend to this higher mountain. Right. It's like he's saying you can either choose the hard way or the easy way. The easy way. The easy way is given. Right. And, and like I said, there's various ways of giving. But let me show you one other verse here that's coming out of teaching 49 verse 55 of the book of Chile. all right it says truly i say to you that on many occasions you find yourselves empty-handed in the presence of those who are needy your spirits will always have something to give when you have nothing material to share with your brothers allow your spirits to give from the many gifts that you possess but you must recognize that when it is necessary for your charity to be material, you should not avoid the fulfillment of your duty claiming that your intentions were sufficient. Learn from your father who gives you everything that you need for your spirit as well as your material body. Learn from the Messiah who taught you how to offer everything that you would have as charity toward your brother. So prayer is a necessary part of charity as well. Right. But we can't leave out the material element. There's a lot of people who just want to pray while they keep their material possessions. Yeah, being able to, your material possessions is, you know, I think a great way for the Father to actually test your true heart because um, it's easy for us to say, and he even talks about this in scripture, that, you know, I'll pray for you. But, you know, a lot of times the people that you are praying for, you know, they just need that material blessing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, pray for me as well. I'm not saying not to pray for a person, but, you know, if I need food right then and there, your prayers are great. But, you know, that I sandwich would be nice yeah. as well. So I think that's exactly what he's, he's talking about. This kind of reminds us what we read over in Isaiah chapter 58, where it's talking about the things we have to do in order to receive the promises of Jacob. Right. Well, it's talking about how we ought to deal the bread to the hungry, um, give them clothes, you know, give them shelter, taking care of the people in need. Mm -hmm. Well, 
it extends further than that. Not just our material possessions, but it's our time, our skills, even a bit of knowledge that we can share with an individual can go a long way as helping them from time to time. You never know what form your charity can come through. My point is, is that it needs to come through everywhere based on my testimony. And I know this just my testimony, but what I've learned over this last month is that we need to be doing everything we can to help people. Right. One guy, he had got a virus on his phone that he couldn't get it off. And me sitting there knowing how to delete the apps that was, you know, causing the problems on the phone. Now he has a phone. That wasn't my money. It didn't take much time. It didn't take much resources at all. It was just little simple knowledge that this program can be deleted and now you have a cell phone again. Help that man tremendously. Right. It's everything. Anything we can do to help people, we need to be looking for the opportunity, holding doors, saying thank you, anything right. that blesses a person, acts as our charity, including prayer. Mm -hmm. And my point is now is the time to do it. Right. It stops the pain. I, I, I've been trying to figure out how I can work this in. I've been thinking about this all night. But when it boils down to it, the people around you are going to say thank you or blank you. In other words, if we're stingy towards the people around us, we're going to get persecutions and trouble. If we start doing charitable deeds for these same people, instead of them coming and blessing us out and putting us down, humiliating us, they will actually be grateful and start treating us with appreciation. And that's one of the things that I've learned over the course of this month is doing charitable deeds changes your life. It literally takes you from a life of torment and pain to one of blessings and it's, cheerfulness. Yeah, it's actually a win-win because not only are you helping yourself as far as the restitution, but you're actually helping the other person as well. Yep. And so that's a great thing altogether. Mm -hmm. And in the meantime, we want to say happy first fruits and shalawama. Shalawama.